Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. The S&P 500 hit a record high, but the other markets did not. Ross takes a look at what's happening with gold and silver, the U.S. and Canadian dollars, and Bitcoin. Noted international trader and fiction author Doug Casey joins us from Uruguay. He gives us his naughty and nice list for the year and comments on inflation, government corruption, precious metals, junior stocks, and battery metals. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Best of the season to you and to all of our listeners. And uh, Let's hope that uh, the markets uh, present the type of opportunities this coming year that they did uh, in last year. When the bells were ringing at the S&P 500, uh, not only was it for Christmas, but they were pretty happy because they set a record high once again. But what's the real story going on in the stock markets right now? Well, once again, this gets down to a smaller group that's leading on the upside, uh, it's the big capitalization uh, stocks that are making the best of the moves. Um, you know, this uh, we had a we had a decent pullback, uh, which you you typically want to see uh, in the early part of December. Uh, typically, uh, looking for a December tenth to twentieth to find a low, a nice oversold level, and to get a reversal, and then that turns into the Santa Claus rally, or as we've uh, looked at it, uh, the turn of the year trade, where the strength tends to carry you into at least that first January, uh, Jan- first week of January. And you then are very, very uh, cautious in terms of watching to see what the pullbacks are like. Because, um, you know, historically, if we look at it, the, the last 50 years, 30 of the years in the S&P broke out through the December high in January and then just continued to push along really nice through January, February, sometimes much better than that, but usually you get off to a pretty good start. Eight of the years had a small pause just uh, trying to get through the December high, but once they did, they had good running room in the upside. It's those ones that failed, and they're the important ones because there's the, the the 2015 or the 2008 or, 2000, or uh, 1972. Those turn of the year tops became really important ones. So you always, you know, like to be with the trend, but aware of what happens if things start to roll over. So. Um, the pullbacks this last couple of weeks um, of the high cap stocks, and there's an index out there of the top 1,000. 12% of those produced good, uh, what we call a springboard buy. So that's a minor oversold condition within a dominant uptrend. So the weekly charts punch those out, and invariably what you get from that is not just a move off a low, but generally we'll push through to new highs. We have some other signals that are look for very hard oversold, and you get a bounce. But once you get the springboard, you tend to have longevity in the move. So um, S&P looks good. The uh, Russell, the uh, NASDAQ, the Dow um, still faltering a little bit uh, relative to um, the highs. The Russell's the one that uh, looks at this point to be the weakest. And uh, unless it really gains some upside momentum here um, going into the new year, I think uh, you're going to see that one roll over. So um, in terms of the markets, enjoy the Santa Claus rally while it's on. 
Now, uh, taking a look at uh, some particular individual things, gold and silver, how are they holding up? Gold and silver, um, really nice turn at the uh, beginning of the month, and um, we're into a seasonally favorable window. Generally, that starts around the 14th of December, you know, plus or minus a given period. So what we had was an oversold, then the relative strength index went back from being uh, oversold to going back to neutral. It did that again here in the last week and a half. So you've got a nice double bottom as far as gold is concerned. We're at 1809, and um, I think it's got uh, legs in it. Uh, could continue for, you know, right through uh, the next month or so. We'll see how it looks. Uh, the... Uh, the miners, the GDX, the GDXJ indices, not performing as well as the bullions, so that's a cause for concern. So, um, the if, if anything, uh, look for silver to probably underperform gold on this move, and um, we'll uh, we'll keep our eye on that one. It's it also fits in uh, with what has been happening on the dollar index. Uh, U.S. dollar had been pushing up into good resistance around the 97 level, spent the better part now of a month trying to get through there and hasn't done it. Uh, as of the end of the week, closing just below its 20-day average at uh, just under 96, probably ready to drop back into the 95 to 95 and a half range uh, as part of this rising trend that it's been in since last May. Um, so uh, if you see continued uh, easing back there, that would be supportive to precious metals. The Canadian dollar has fallen four or five cents from its peak. Uh, do you see it to continue to fall? Yeah, I, I can. When you take a look at it, you know, as a commodity-based currency, the you know when you see the strength that we've had here in the precious in the in the oil market, you know, we've been down to sixty-two and now back up to seventy-three eighty. Um, you've got the copper market uh, uh, now back at 440. Um, the uh, most of the agricultural commodities have bounced well off their lows, and here's the Canadian dollar it's stuck down here at 78 cents. This is this is not good. Um, the the dollar uh, has got to say weakness relative to items that should be supportive of it, and so we don't want to get into the politics of why Canada might be done doing poorly. But the fact is that it is, and uh, you know if we were to compare that to say what's happening say with Australia, um, Australia bottomed out at the first of the month and is starting to stair step up reasonably well compared to Canadian dollar. So. Um, I'm I'm not a fan of Canada right now, and uh, would uh, be looking for more for a reason to sell into strength than to uh, uh, be buying any weakness. What's happening with commodities like copper? Well, as I mentioned, the the copper and the oil market uh, both came down. So they both have been in methodical uptrends here. There's no question about that. You look at uh, the, uh, the copper market to going back into uh, the May of last year, March of last year, good strong move into this spring. And now it's gone through a pretty steady consolidation in this 450 range, plus or minus 20 points. And it's just come along, kissed its uh, long-term moving average that I look at the 50-week. Nice oversold a week ago and starting to show some strength up to 440. And when we take a look over at uh, the crude oil, you got similar type of action. Uh, the panic low in uh, uh, March of a year ago, when we actually went to minus numbers. But since then, uh, we've had this nice trading range since the spring in the um, I call it the low 60s to high 70s primarily. Uh, that also is kissed against its 50-week moving average within this last three weeks. Nicely oversold and starting to turn higher. So, you know, the two items moving together, and, um, you know, I, I think they've got a chance to have a decent rally. The, um, you know, it's important to watch the, the supporting lows that we put in here. I wouldn't want to risk uh, anything beyond those, but, you know, the, the best trades are when you're closest to support and you're questioning the uptrend. On the cryptocurrency front, what's going on? 
Uh, pretty good turn. Uh, up uh, the latter part of the week, we've got uh, Bitcoin uh, at uh, 50800 to finish off the, the week. Had that big spike down in uh, the first week of December, down to 42000 And um, we're a decent bounce off of that, retested the low, and now it's back to retesting that same resistance that it had on the first bounce. And uh, if it can't manage to get through the uh, this fifty two to fifty three thousand level, then uh, I think uh, there's probably um, some uh, further to be had on the downside. Remember, this just topped out at what sixty eight thousand, sixty nine thousand, just uh, a month and a half ago. So it's uh, it's had a pretty rough stretch, and uh, so far um, I think it's. Uh, uh, we're still looking for better proof that um, this is an interim low here. Ross, thank you so much for the update. It's been a pleasure to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Doug Casey, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Doug Casey, author of Assassin, the latest novel in the High Ground series, available online at highgroundseries.com. Doug's YouTube channel is Doug Casey's Take, and his website is internationalman.com. He's speaking to us from Uruguay. Doug, welcome back to This Week in Money, and Merry Christmas. Well, thanks, Jim, although technically speaking, it's the uh, winter solstice which we can also celebrate where you are, and the summer solstice, which uh, down where I am here. But uh, when Christmas comes up, well, actually, it is Christmas, I guess, when this is going to be aired. But uh, So excuse that little glitch on my part. But I celebrate the solstice season as well as Christmas. Mm -hmm. I don't celebrate the holiday season. That's too politically correct. Well, uh... <laughs> My friends in Australia say we, we put on our Santa hats and then head to the beach for Christmas. Yeah, well, not this year in Australia. They'll probably all be locked up in their apartments with, with police roving the streets to keep them there. Well, I think you can't catch anything except sharks if you go down to the beach in nice fresh air. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Well, I'd be much more afraid of the Australian government if I was down there than I would be of sharks on the beach. Doug, are you currently finding freedom in Uruguay? Well, Uruguay is perhaps the most rational of the Latin American countries at this point. Uh, there are inconveniences to do with the COVID hysteria, but uh, I haven't found them to be too serious. Although I spend most of my time out here on my farm, so uh, I don't have an awful lot of contact with, uh, with the masses. But it's not bad. Certainly not as bad as it is in Canada right now. Will you have another novel out in the new year? Well, we're working on novel number four in a seven novel series. And uh, after Speculator, which was the first, and then Drug Lord, and then third, Assassin, we trace the pilgrim's progress of our hero, Charles Knight. So uh, now he's accused of being a terrorist in novel four, which will be out within the year. And uh, I've got a lot of interesting thoughts on terrorism uh, as a method of warfare, techniques of terrorism, definitions of terrorism. Uh, and, of course, in, in the United States, a lot of average Americans are being accused of terrorism because of the January 6th event. So I have no doubts that the U.S. government is going to uh, get on the terrorism hobby horse and ride it for all that it's worth to uh, gain more control and more power. But 
terrorism, terrorists will be the next novel. But that's about a year in the future, I'm afraid. How are things that Doug Casey's take on YouTube? Well, it grows. Um, the content that we have on Doug Casey's take on YouTube is pretty similar to the type of take that you and I are going to right now. We cover the entire waterfront, um, current events, philosophy, science, technology, history. So uh, I hope people tune into it and uh, find lots of good things. <clears throat> We've done about 150 of them so far. This show will be airing on Christmas Day, so who's on your nice list, naughty list, and who gets a lump of coal? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot more coal being given out this year uh, than um, sugar plums. But um, certainly high on the list of naughties are the uh, Jacobins that are running the U.S. government at this point. I mean, these people are psychologically identical, philosophically identical to the people that took over France in 1789 and it wound up in the Great Terror a few years later. So they get a lump of coal for sure, but governments everywhere get lumps of coal for their stupidity uh, in reaction to the uh, COVID, uh, especially New Zealand, Australia, and Canada which are especially stupid, their governments. Uh, on the nice list, uh, I would uh, put the p protesters against passports, vaccine passports, masks, and forced vaccinations, because I'm of the opinion that this COVID thing, which can be very dangerous for people that are old or have serious comorbidities, but they're the only people that have anything to worry about, and they ought to look out. But um, this, this, this COVID thing is being used as an excuse to give uh, governments control of your own body in addition. So that's my naughty and nice list this year. A number of people are predicting the topping of the U.S. stock markets. Are you on side with those people? I am, by all parameters the U.S. stock market is at all-time highs. Uh, at the same time, we're getting deeper into what I call the Greater Depression, and it's being disguised, or has been disguised, by creating trillions of new dollars, which make people feel richer than they really are, and uh, artificially jacks up consumption. So I don't want anything to do with the U.S. stock market, but I'm afraid to go short because I don't know. You know, there's no way of telling how high a tree is going to grow. So it's it's dangerous to fight the Fed, but I, I'm completely uninvolved in the U.S. stock market at this point. It's just very dangerous, very overpriced. What do stock markets usually do during inflationary times? Well, it depends on a lot of things. Generally speaking, inflation is very bad for stock markets. Why is that? Because inflation destroys capital. Inflation is a subtle type of taxation where uh, the government prints up the money and gets to spend it first instead of taxing it directly from people. And that withdraws capital from the productive part of uh, the economy. So uh, ultimately, inflation is very bad for the stock market. However, in the short run, it can look like it's very good, like it does now in the U.S. and many other places, because all this money that the government's created is flowing into the stock market. It's running to hide there in real assets, uh, ephemeral assets in the case of many of the tech companies at this point. So um, at some point, inflation is going to wind up devastating the stock market. But right now, all that money that they're creating is, is making a boom. What do you think the real rate of inflation is? Well, the government says 6% now. But uh, if you computed inflation the same way as they did in 1980, say, uh, 
before hedonic adjustments, so-called, and manipulating how much for rent, uh, how much for gasoline, and all this type of thing. It's all very political. Uh, the U.S. government's figures are not as bad as those of the Argentine government uh, down in this part of the world, but they're, they're no longer reliable. My guess, the inflation rate is someplace north of 10%, closing in on 15%. Uh, it's a question of going out and looking and seeing with your own eyes. And uh, if reality that you see doesn't correspond with what the government says, who are you going to believe, the government or your own lying eyes? Are bank bail-ins becoming more likely? Uh, yes, they are, because with the U.S. government running trillion-dollar deficits, as far as the eye can see, and maybe multi-trillion-dollar deficits is definitely, uh, deficits is, is as outrageous as that is to contemplate. Uh, they're no longer going to be in a position, of both financially and in some ways politically, to bail out big banks and maybe big insurance companies too. So um, you shouldn't keep more than the insured amount in any one account. And you should spread your money out. If you have a lot of money, spread it out between banks, but uh, no more than is insured in any one account. Yeah, bail is where the, gov where the bank basically takes your money to solve their problems. They look at your deposit as a liability, uh, like their rent payment or something like that. No, nothing, nothing beyond that. So, yeah, it's dangerous, the possibility. The first one happened in Cyprus 10 years ago, but we'll see lots of them in the future. Now, what we've just seen recently is banks making near record profits, and instead of putting that money away in a rainy day fund, they're buying back their own shares. Do those banks deserve to be bailed out or bailed in when they had the money on hand to look after themselves? No, I know it's, it, it's, it's disgusting. When these banks buy back their own shares, especially now when the stock market is so overpriced, the only rationale I can see for it is that uh, they want to, to jam their stock prices higher so that the management can cash in their options. Uh, but no, it's not good at all. <laughs> they should be building reserves as opposed to dissipating them by buying their own overpriced paper. You're right. Are gold and silver failing as inflation hedges? No, I think what we're looking at now is something that the paleontologists call punctuated disequilibrium. Where, in other words, things stay stable wherever they are for a long period of time, and all of a sudden something happens and things change radically. And the gold and silver markets are a little bit like that. Um, incidentally, right now, at let's say 1750, 1800, whatever gold is, um, it's actually fairly priced, in my opinion, relative to everything else in the world. Uh, don't forget that gold was grossly underpriced at $35 in 1971 and grossly underpriced at, say, 250 in 2001. Uh, but now it's kind of reasonably priced. So I continue to buy gold, as I always have, for savings, for prudence, for safety, uh, I, and I think it's going to go much higher in the future, but uh, that's the way I view it at the moment. I want to speculate, I speculate in gold stocks, which really are cheap now. If you held gold and silver, could you boost the price by encouraging everybody else who held gold and silver to demand the delivery of their physical product right now? Mm. Well, I suppose, and people, if listen, everybody should have a bunch of precious metals in their own possession. I mean, in the safest place you can think of, which may not even be a safe deposit box. Um, you shouldn't have it out in the cloud and out in the ether held by somebody else because anything could happen to that somebody else is holding your gold and silver. So to answer the question, yeah, you should take delivery of a good portion, at least, of your gold and silver. And um, that uh, might be very bullish for the prices of the metals. 
As more and more automakers are producing electric vehicles, is the availability of battery metals key to their success? And are you bullish on battery metals? Well, the way I'm playing battery metals is uh, I was a founding shareholder of a company called Nova, uh, traded uh, in the U.S. And um, they're a royalty company that buys royal royalties of copper, nickel, and some other uh, battery metals. And that's the way I'm playing it, uh, as opposed to speculating in the stocks directly. Uh, because, of course, a royalty... Uh, when a pound of copper is mined, if you've got a 2% royalty on that mine, you get your 2% of that pound of copper, regardless of whether the company is making money or not. So uh, I am bullish on battery metals, uh, and that's the way I'm playing it, frankly. That's, that's talking my own book, of course, Jim, but it's one of my largest positions, and I don't own it because I think the stock's going down. Are you currently seeing any unloved sectors in the junior markets? The entire mining section of the junior market, especially gold and silver, they're very unloved and very cheap. In relative terms, relative to the stock market, they're at about their cheapest levels in history. Um, I think that um, as the governments keep creating money, uh, speculative interest is going to rotate into these junior miners. And many times in the past, since gold was liberated 50 years ago, these, the junior market as a whole has gone up 10 to 1. Some stocks have gone up 50 to 1, 100 to 1, usually crashed after that. But uh, I suspect we're going to see a speculative bubble in the junior mining stocks. And that's where I'm very, very uh, heavily invested or heavily speculating, I should say. How important is promotion to realize the true value of stocks? Well, look, promotion is important. You don't want to put your light under a basket so nobody can see it. But um, in, a, in a crazy speculative market like we are today, uh, promotion is, I'm afraid, overemphasized. Look at things like uh, GameStop. Uh, this is a company that really should be bankrupt, but a meme started indirect promotion. The company didn't do it, to my knowledge. And it, it jammed it way beyond its uh, realistic value. So um, I'm all for promotion. But um, I don't like to buy stocks that I think are being promoted. Let me put it that way. Are junior stocks easier to promote in Canada or the U.S.? <sighs> That's a good question. Because um, the rules are a little bit different in both companies, uh, both countries. Um I'm not sure I'd even draw a distinction anymore between the U.S. and Canada as much as I might have in the past because all these world markets with the Internet have become more and more integrated and most Canadian stocks are traded in the U.S. Um, Let's just say that most small stocks are crap. They're undercapitalized. They have unseason management. uh, They're startups, all kinds of problems. So... um, once again, promotion can be more of a more of a problem than anything else, and uh, I, I, I I tend not to buy anything that I think is being promoted. Is Vancouver still the junior mining capital of the world? Yeah, it is. I think uh, it's still true that about eighty percent of the capital for mining in the world is raised in Canada, and. Uh, when it comes to smaller stocks, it's mostly raised in Vancouver. I love Vancouver. Uh, I used to live there. Uh, most of the stocks that I own in this sector are creatures of Vancouver. So, yeah, it is still the capital. It's the toughest part of speculating knowing when to sell. Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can buy something because you believe in the fundamentals or any of a number of other factors that will eventually take a stock up. Uh, that's a lot easier than figuring out when to sell because if you get lucky and the stock goes up and you're in a mania, uh, well, you don't want to sell because maybe it'll double and double again and double again. Uh, and, of course, what if you own Microsoft back in or Berkshire Hathaway or, you know, one of these great uh, conventional bull market babies? 
I mean, if you sold it after it doubled or went up 10 times or even 100 times, it would have been a big mistake. So, yeah, it's hard to know when to sell. Recently, in uranium, the uranium market, which I'm, I'm very involved in and very bullish on, I've got to say, uh, the uranium stocks ran up a lot, got ahead of themselves, had come down as a group, maybe 30, 40 percent. Uh, does that mean I should have sold? Well, everybody wants to sell at the top, but I think uranium's going higher. So I think the major trend is still uh, in, mo in motion. Certainly there's no bubble in uranium from the part of the general public. Uh, they don't even know that it's an element half the time. So, uh, yeah, selling, selling is tough for, for that reason. The full uptick rule has not been reinstated in Canada or the U.S. Could this be an example of the powers that be gaming the system? Well, the powers that be do game the system uh, in every way possible. Uh, I try not to clutter my mind up with with their rules, which can change radically. I think that the regulatory agencies in both the U.S. and Canada basically should be abolished. Uh, they absorb, you know, in the case of the SEC, I can tell you that uh, the direct cost of running the SEC is a couple to three billion dollars per year, but that's minor. Uh, the direct cost to pay their expenses and salaries relative to the burdens that they put on companies, which are scores of billions of dollars, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars per year. So that's my answer to that. Are you surprised at how widespread evil is in the world? Evil. What is evil? Purposeful destruction. Perhaps we can use that as a working definition. Uh, you know, as I look around at all the crazy things going on in the world, uh, wars and rumors of wars, not the thing you want to talk about on Christmas, obviously, but um, we may be living on the planet of the crazy chimpanzees. And I've long been of the opinion that everybody, we have taken as an individual, is reasonably sensible. But as once he becomes a part of a, a group, uh, he turns into a blockhead. I think Schiller originally said that a couple hundred years ago when he was right. The problem that we have is that all the worst things that, that germinate in people's minds, uh, when those people go into government where they have the power to hold a gun to other people's heads, uh, Evil goes on steroids, and the reason for that is because government, the entity itself, I'm not talking about any particular administration, although some are obviously much worse than others, uh, bad people are drawn to government. Why? Because you got two kinds of people in the world. People that like to deal in the physical universe and create things, and that's good. Then you got people that want to control other people and manipulate other people. And they all go into government. So government is the problem when we talk about widespread evil in the world. We'll have more with Doug Casey right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Doug Casey. Is China attempting to take over the world with vaccine passports and their social credit system? Well, I don't think they're attempting to take over the world. Uh, but uh, their social credit system is a disaster from the point of view of personal freedom of everybody. Uh, anything you do, any place you go, anything you say, anything you think, and when they digitize the money, <clears throat> which we're well on the way to doing, anything you own or buy or sell, uh, government is going to have uh, complete knowledge of that, and they'll use that knowledge to manipulate you brutally. So China's kind of leading the way on these things, but uh, the problem isn't China. The problem is is uh, the state and the fact that the average person, 
idiotically supports the state. Agenda 2030, the Great Reset. Would you be happy to own nothing in 2030? No, it's anti-human. Um, you know what these people that are talking about the Great Reset? You know they basically see themselves as being the puppet masters, and see us as being the the plebes, the white poi, uh, the cattle. And uh, I'm totally opposed anything that smacks of the great reset. And, of course, this current COVID psychosis uh, is kind of the uh, opening wedge of uh, the great reset. And they really want to upset uh, everything in current society. So, uh, no, I won't be happy to own nothing, but that's the direction uh, these horrible people are taking us. What are you hearing on the experimental injections that are in human trials? Well, I think the COVID vaccine itself is an experimental injection. It's uh, it's a technology which even its inventor says uh, shouldn't be used for this. There's lots and lots of anecdotal evidence uh, of people that are that are taking the jab that. Uh, some are dying, some are permanently disabled, some are very sick. Uh, but since uh, an intelligent conversation is impossible about this, the statistics are unreliable. It's so highly politicized, we don't really know what the hell is going on. It's just very suspicious that with a, what amounts to a, a mild, <clears throat> a relatively ordinary seasonal flu, like Asian flu, swine flu, uh, uh, Hong Kong flu, uh, that have come before it. Uh, this flu is no different at all, but it's been made into a worldwide psychosis. And these injections, uh, I mean, I'm not opposed to vaccines per se. I mean, Edward Jenner, two centuries ago, showed us how to cure smallpox, so... Nothing wrong with the idea of uh, vaccines. It's just gotten completely out of control. And um, the fact that kids, you know, with their with their uh, undeveloped immune systems, are given something like sixty or seventy injections uh, before they're even six years old, very very dangerous. And uh, I'm not planning on, if ever getting a COVID uh, injection uh, until I can see with my own eyes what the uh, results of it are. Is the entire world looking like Germany in the late 1930s? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I think the whole world is heading towards war. Uh, when things go bad domestically and the economies will collapse uh, because of all the money they're printing, which currently looks like a palliative, uh, but it's not. It's uh, They tend to blame other countries for their own problems, and that leads to wars and things of that nature. So I think we're looking during this decade at genuine chaos everywhere. So uh, hold on to your hat and uh, plan ahead with that in mind, I'd say. Yes, it does look like the late 1930s. There's rumors of the jabs being able to connect people to the Internet of Things. Could that produce the zombies that are being talked about? <laughs> I think all the zombie movies that we have today are <laughs> indicative. But uh, I have no idea uh, how to answer that question because I just don't know. Well, anything, is, anything is possible in today's crazy world. Your thoughts on Canada? Know. I'd say Canada is even more screwed than the U.S. is. Uh, it's true we've got ideological Jacobins running the show in Washington, and the idiotic American voter probably elected them. I mean, I don't know. There's all kinds of funny things that happened during the last election. But Trudeau is even worse, uh, for God's sake. So uh, 
It amazes me that the average Canadian uh, elected uh, the current Trudeau because he has the same name as as Pierre, the, his purported father. Uh, I won't go into the theories about maybe Pierre wasn't actually uh, just his father. Anyway, he's a horrible person, horrible ideas. Uh, he's leading Canada down the wrong road. So, best of luck. I'm, I'm, I'm a long-time fan of Canada. We used to live there, but uh, it's going the wrong way. It's headed towards Australia, which is even worse. As we go forward, do you think people living in Canada and the U.S. would be better off living in cities, suburbs, or rural areas, taking into account availability of food, water, safety, and freedom? Well, it depends on your personal, financial, and other situations. Uh, look, if you want to make money, and it's the you, um, you know, that's why people are moving to cities. It's economically, the best place to be. Uh, but I've done pretty well in my lifetime, and I've always I've always lived in cities. But essentially, I'm a country boy, and uh, here in South America or in North America, I live on farms or rural areas because if things get bad. Uh, people in cities could chip out, and it could get very dangerous and very inconvenient. So my answer is, if you're in a position to do so, uh, I'd say select for a rural area. Should we get used to supply shortages? Well, I don't want to get used to them, but people forget that, especially in today's modern world, uh, about a hundred things have to work properly, on time, on price, without fail, to produce anything. Stuff from around the world has to come together in one place, on time, to uh, make anything. Uh, we're talking about a car, an iPhone, a toaster, a pencil. Um, and with the... Uh, Increasing stress that governments are putting on uh, corporations and more regulations and God knows what, uh, you know, our supply chain can be broken just in one place and then it breaks the supply chain the rest of the way up and those supply chains break other supply chains. So, look, there's no guarantee that bread is going to occur on your shelf at the local Safeway. Uh, every day, uh, if for any reason, and there are lots of reasons I could give, food doesn't come to, into the cities for three days, people are going to start starving. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we've always been on a razor's edge when it comes to maintaining civilization. Uh, so anything's possible today. Could we be on the precipice of a civilization collapsing extinction event? Well, you know, people like Bill Gates and Ted Turner and that whole coterie of people that go to the World Economic Forum in Davos every year, <clears throat> you know, they've been mumbling for years about how the world really should have a lot less people than it does. Uh, and apparently, they're in, they have real power real power, uh, as evidenced by this COVID psychosis. So, um, look, anything anything is possible. And at this point, with the markets overpriced and the world over-indebted and all kinds of um, ethnic hatreds being created by certain forces, yeah, uh, I, I would, uh, for the next 10 years, look at the negative possibilities. Although, looking out 20 years from now, with a little bit of luck, maybe we'll see the, um, maybe we'll see the singularity and uh, it'll solve a lot of problems. But uh, the next couple of years are going to be pretty, pretty crusty. In the case of a civilization collapsing extinction event, would there be opportunities amongst the devastation? Yeah, how about not getting eaten by a zombie and staying alive? 
uh, I don't know how bad it's going to get. But yeah, sure, there's always opportunities. But um, most people won't be prepared for them. I hope that I, I'm not unprepared for them. I mean, this is what the black swan is all about. You don't even know it exists. So, real danger. Could the Greater Depression be around the corner? Well, I've been predicting the Greater Depression for a long time. And you have to define the word depression. It's a period of time when most people's standard of living drops significantly. And um, I think that's the case today, albeit it's disguised by the creation of huge amounts of money, which just means that when that blows up through inflation or defaults, the depression is going to be even worse. But we're already in the greater depression. And uh, one of the problems with this current COVID hysteria is that the economic problems that we'll be facing will be blamed on the virus instead of blamed on the people that are actually causing it. The people in government that uh, are destroying the currency and taxing citizens to death and regulating them to death. So we're already involved in the Greater Depression. It's already here. Where can people follow you and find out more about your book? Well, thanks, Jim. Uh, it's on Amazon, of course, but they can go on <clears throat> the Internet to uh, highgroundseries.com. And uh, if, they, if you want, you can get a signed hardback, signed by both me and uh, John Hunt, my co-author. Um, and otherwise... Uh, go on internationalman.com. We've got great articles there every day for free. Uh, it's a blog. And uh, go to Doug Casey's Take on YouTube where uh, we have lots of detailed discussion and uh, lots of events of all types. So thanks for asking, Jim. Doug, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money and have a great Christmas and New Year. Thank you very much, and to you and yours, and all your listeners as well. I've been speaking with Doug Casey, his YouTube channel, Doug Casey's Take, his website, internationalman.com. He was speaking to us from Uruguay. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark and Doug Casey, and thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Merry Christmas. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Merry Christmas, Larry. Merry Christmas, Jim. You guys are always busy, so even uh, just before Christmas, you have a news release for us. Yeah, we had one out yesterday, which was an excellent uh, review on our 2021 hi uh, highlights. And some of the major things in there was some of the uh, patents that we received and uh, the work we've done with under NDAs with some of the uh, OEMs. So it's... Uh, it's a it's a real good place to go to, you know, just to get a recap of uh, some of the more important things that we've done. And uh of course involved in that is the 25 million 20 million dollar uh private uh, not private placement but the brokered placement in the US with the uh with a bunch of uh you know funds and that uh certainly put us in a very good cash position. So uh, with that money and about $6 million that was received on issued warrants and options, we're still sitting on $22 million, and we've paid for a lot of the equipment for the demonstration plants. So that is a big plus for us going into the new year. It gives us a clear runway to uh, 
actually uh, start, uh, you know, designing and uh, building the commercial plant sometime as soon as the demonstration plant is complete. But uh, I can't wait for the demonstration plant to be up and running so that we can have uh, interested parties come in and uh, take a look at it. It's uh, it's an exciting event for us. So uh, <clears throat> you have to... I got a frog in my throat, so uh, it makes uh, talking a little difficult. But uh, anyway, the uh, it, it was an uplifting uh, uh, release. Uh, everybody liked it, but um, there's certain factors in the market that uh, didn't like it, so they moved the stock down uh, considerably, four cents yesterday. And uh, we're trying to gain that back today. So... Uh, you know, that's, that's enough about the release. Anybody can read it so they get a, a real thumbnail sketch of what the company's been up to for the last year. And the Wendon stockpile, uh, it also has that in there. We're still talking to the, uh, the, uh, Defense Logistics Agency, the DLA, on, uh, you know, getting the uh, second, uh, part going, which is a bigger bulk sample through the, uh, through the pilot plant rather than bench scale testing. But uh, anybody that's dealt with governments before realize that there's a lot of hoops to go through, and uh, we can't give a timeline on when that will be awarded, but I suspect that it will be because it's a definite answer to uh, to uh, what they require uh, for manganese. And manganese is uh, critical metal in the United States, and, uh, you know, that will hopefully move us on to uh, actually restarting our old pre-feasibility study, and uh, although we may look at uh, developing tonnage and higher grades, something like almost two times uh, on some of our own claims, rather, because we dropped all the... Uh, all of the uh, agreements that we had because it was too costly uh, after 2011, 2012. And uh, so the uh, – but we're, we're looking forward to an exciting time. And just to give you an update on the permits, uh, we're still working with uh, interested groups and the native population up there on uh, on getting our uh, – our permits for uh, exploration and uh, this, this is a quite a convoluted group it's uh, there's uh, several houses involved and uh, you know we think we only got one involved but there's others that think they're involved and uh, so anyway it's just a just a matter of uh, working this through the system and to get our permits and uh, hopefully we'll have those for uh, you know next summer uh, to do some drilling up there and uh, we expect that we'll have the completed uh, survey in from the uh, geophysics we've done. So everything is starting to look pretty exciting, and uh, it looks like it's going to be a great 2022, and uh, I predict that uh, there's going to be a big market in recycling, and, uh, you know, I hear other people talking about it and uh, read some of the articles on it, and I think that recycling is going to be the top of the top of the uh, heap um, when it comes to EV cars. And uh, so that's uh, that's kind of where we sit right now. And uh, it's uh, I think that uh, we're probably going to have a better year next year than we had this year, even though we did go to 285. And uh, but I think that we will uh, see new highs next year. So. Uh, that's uh that's exciting and uh certainly would uh, look good on my stock position i'm sure that everybody's stock position would start to look a lot better and uh you know i always say you know buy the dips but uh i'm not sure uh when this uh this uh selling's going to end and it's uh you know i'll we'll attach another uh the latest uh update on the uh, selling in the OTC and uh, how much is being shorted. So uh, you'll be able to see that. It's a, it's a lot of stock and, uh, you know, it just doesn't exist. 
It's, uh, you know, it, uh, they don't have ownership of that stock, and, uh, but they sell it. And, uh, so that's, that's very difficult. Anyway, I wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year. And, uh, you too, Jim, and everybody else at Howe Street. And, uh, I hope that, uh, this coming year will be as good as forecasted. Uh, one of the guys I follow is forecasting the best supermarket ever. And, uh, especially when you reach down to the, uh, small caps and the uh, mid caps and uh, micro caps and uh, that's uh, that's where the money's going to be made so anyway have a happy merry christmas and a happy new year larry for someone who would like to talk a little american manganese stock under the christmas tree uh where are you traded and where can they get more information about the company okay we're traded on the uh toronto venture exchange under the symbol amy we're traded on the USQB exchange under the symbol AMYZF, and we're traded in Frankfurt under the symbol 2AM. So uh, you can go and get all the information that you need at our uh, website, which is AmericanManganeseInc.com, or if you want to have uh, you know some quick answers to some of your questions, you can phone at uh, phone us here at. Uh, Seven seven eight five seven four 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 four, or you can send me an email at l r e a u g h at a m y m n dot com, and uh, just a couple. I just remembered a couple questions that were asked, and that was what the cost of uh, of our uh, of our patents were, and they run between forty and fifty thousand dollars. Does not include all the R and D that's done on it. And the justification for uh, issuing or for putting that patent together, and uh, so that's just a piece of information that everybody wants. So uh, you know, and we've got uh, we've got a lot of patents in the pipeline, and we've got a lot of patents that are issued. So uh, that's a one big plus for the company. So uh, and that's kind of the end of my podcast, Jim. Larry, have a great Christmas. I certainly will, and uh, you have a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, Jim. My guest has been Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on December 23rd. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.